I'm a, I actually started out in theoretical physics. I did my, essentially my master's work in string theory before moving to biology. Uh, mostly theoretical biophysics and computational biophysics. But um, in the mid-2000s, midway through graduate school, um, a revolution started happening. Uh, there was just an incredible revolution in our ability to sequence DNA. And I found this so compelling that I actually went from being um, a theorist to doing experiments in my last year of graduate school. And I don't recommend that necessarily, but um, uh, I, I absolutely fell in love with the new DNA sequencing technologies because um, I really viewed them as a new way to extract information about biology out of cells, a new way to gather information about how the world works that's different than microscopes, which is kind of the mainstay of uh, uh, biology and biophysics. So um, uh, the, the title of this talk is Seeing with Sequencing, because I really think that DNA sequencing um, beyond sequencing our individual genomes, it can tell us a lot about how biology works at a fundamental level. Um, so I'm first going to go through the history of sequencing a bit, and then I'm going to provide uh, two examples of how we can use high-throughput sequencing to do interesting science beyond just sequencing genomes. And then David and Molly are going to uh, continue on. So um, uh, inside your cells, there are chromosomes. And these chromosomes contain all the genetic information that you received from your parents and that you'll, uh, you'll pass on to your offspring. These chromosomes are made of these things called nucleosomes, which are actually, is actually DNA wrapped around, very, very tightly around little proteins called histones. And within, within each one of your cells, there's about 4.6 billion uh, nucleotides of DNA, of base pairs of DNA. So this is what DNA looks like up close, you'll notice that this also looks like the uh, sculpture right outside this room. Uh, so DNA is a uh, very famously a double helix. Um, and within the middle of this double helix, there's a ladder. Um, and this ladder, each rung of this ladder is made up of two bases. Here it's an A and a T. Here it's a G and a C. And it's the sequence of these rungs that we refer to as the sequence of DNA. So specifically, what we do is we trace one of these backbones from what's called the five prime end to the three prime end. We trace it around like that. And as we go along, we read out what, what uh, base, what, what you know, uh, end of this rung uh, is at the backbone. And this is what gives us uh, the sequence of DNA. So when you see um, a sequence like C, T, T, C, A. Think about like it's really a sequence that's encoded inside this double helix molecule. And then there's, you know, uh, 3.2 billion of these, uh, well, 4.6 billion of these in each of our cells. So the structure of DNA was discovered in 1953 by Jim Watson and Francis Crick. Um, so here is the double helix I was showing you in the previous slide. Now, uh, Watson and Crick, they weren't doing experiments. They were doing model building. They actually had toys made out of um, uh, metal and that they were trying to fit together to see how could these things fit together in a way that's consistent with some basic uh, facts that were known about DNA as a chemical. Um, the real breakthrough occurred when um, they saw this photo 51, which is data taken by Rosalind Franklin, uh, who was working with Maurice Wilkins. And when they saw this, based on Crick's earlier mathematical work on what, what X-ray diffraction patterns helical structures will produce, they realized, oh, this means DNA must look like that. But note. This was just a realization of the basic structure of the DNA. They did not figure out how to actually, so when, when they realized the structure, they realized, oh, 
This structure could contain any sequence of nucleotides. And it was at that moment that we realized that DNA has sequence and that genetic information is encoded in a sequence of nucleotides. So when I look back at the 1953 discovery, the thing I think is most important about it is that's when we learned that DNA has sequence, and that sequence governs all the biology that goes on in our bodies. But what they didn't know how to do at this time was actually figure out what the sequence of a DNA molecule was. They knew it had a sequence, but they didn't know how to read it. And it actually wasn't until the mid-1970s that efficient methods for reading the sequence out of DNA molecules was invented. So um, uh, this uh, method was invented by Fred Sanger. A slightly different method was, so the standard method that was used for uh, from the mid-1970s mid until about the mid-2000s, and actually still used today, I use it myself, uh, was invented by Fred Sanger. A slightly different method was invented by Wally Gilbert, and they shared the 1980 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the invention of DNA sequencing, uh, or half the prize. Um, uh, so here's a, here's a paper from Sanger. This should be 1977. Uh, this is a paper from Sanger's uh, th this is a figure from Sanger's uh, paper on DNA sequencing. The way it works is you have these big gels. So it's kind of like, it's like jello, like big things of jello. And you run, um, uh, you do a chemical reaction with DNA, and you run the DNA through the gel, and you do this with radioactive DNA. And then you can image how far the DNA goes. Down, this, down the gel, and by reading out the different bands corresponding to the different bases, you can read off the sequence of DNA. So uh, this method, which is called Sanger sequencing, was the mainstay of DNA sequencing, like I said, from the mid-1970s until uh, the mid-2000s. Now, um, that's not to say the method didn't get easier. Um, uh, there was a lot of um, industrial work to scale up uh, ways of sequencing DNA. Um, so this is kind of like the last generation of the, um, of the Sanger sequencing uh, uh, machines. So instead of using these big, uh, these big like foot, you know, multi, like two foot long radioactive gels, they use capillaries, little, little thin tubes uh, through which they would suck in DNA and then read um, uh, a fluorescent signal um, emitted as the uh, DNA goes by a, um, uh, uh, a laser. And uh, this is the sort of data you get back when you do uh, the modern version of Sanger sequencing. You see these fluorescent peaks that go up and down and up and down. And each different color corresponds to a different base. So this corresponds to a G, this corresponds to an A, this corresponds to an A, this corresponds to a G. So this is actually some data that I took from my latest paper. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, and these um, sequencers, um, you know, the chemistry didn't really change from the mid-1970s. What changed was the miniaturization and the, and the addition of, you know, robots to, like, handle many samples in parallel. But still, you know, if I wanted to get a DNA sequence using Sanger sequencing, it costs about $5. I have to give a tube of DNA, and I only get about 800 base pairs back. So, you know, it's okay, but um, it's not enough for the human genome. Well, it was enough for the human genome, actually. So the Human Genome Project um, sequenced all uh, 3.2 billion nucleotides in the human genome um, for a cost of about $5 billion in, in today's dollars. And the way, the way they did this is they just scaled up Sanger sequencing in an industrial fashion. So here's a... Um, a big factory floor at the Whitehead Institute at MIT in 1994, towards the beginning of the um, Human Genome Project. And essentially, in order to do this, uh, in order to cover the human genome with 800 base pair reads, you have to do 4 million individual reactions. And that doesn't even count the overlaps you need to do to make sure you didn't make any uh, mistakes. So, um, but, you know, that's one nice thing. The government can run these very large projects. Um, and so in 2003, they announced uh, 
the first uh, finished draft of the human genome. Um, and this is it in book form. So you can see, you know, roughly how much information that is. So imagine, you know, writing the series of books one sentence at a time. You know, it's kind of what they had to do. So that, 2003, that's about here. So this plot shows the cost of sequencing one million nucleotides of DNA over time. So I entered graduate school in 2002, and then in 2005, ultra-high throughput DNA sequencing methods were first published. I remember very well the uh, 2005 uh, Nature paper by 454 um, uh, uh, announcing, uh, by 454 Biosciences announcing their pyrosequencing method. Um, and it was that that kind of planted the idea into my head that, you know, maybe, Justin, you should start doing experiments. Um, then, from 2007 to 2012, as this high throughput methods became available to most scientists, the cost of sequencing dropped dramatically. It dropped about 10,000 fold over five years. Um, so to put that into perspective, going from this ABI um, sequencer to the Illumina High Seq 2500 um, from 2012, uh, that took five years. Um, that's about as much advancement in throughput as between the Palm Pilot and the iPhone. <laughs> so this is um, uh, what I mean more specifically by this is that the DNA sequencing cost dropped about four times as fast over this five years period as Moore's Law. This is Moore's Law, which, got, which roughly approximates um, how computing power um, drops in cost over time. So this is a real revolution, a real revolution in DNA sequencing. I mean, not just in DNA sequencing, this is a real revolution in biology. And all fields of biology have been deeply affected by the ability, this newfound ability, to extract so much information out of DNA. So um, now I, I'm going to highlight Illumina sequencing, but what, what I want to say is there's actually a lot of different sequencing technologies that were invented. So this, is, um, this shows the machine output in the number of the megabases, the number of millions of nucleotides per run of the machine uh, versus uh, time. Uh, this 454 pyro sequencer was the one that first inspired me back in 2005. Um, this Illumina NextSeq machine, um, which puts out about 30 human genomes per run now, worth of DNA, that's kind of the standard uh, machine that we use now, that I use now at Cold Spring Harbor in my experiment. So here's the NextSeq 500. Uh, in one run of this machine, it will produce 300 million reads. Um, each 300 nucleotides long in about one day for $2,000. So, you know, you know, when I entered graduate school, it was like $5 a reaction, you get 800 bases, and now it's like get 300 million reads for like $2,000. It's just, it's just an incredible, um, uh, it, it's an incredible change. Um, so the way this thing works is uh, there's this flow cell. Flow cell is not very big. It's just about this big. And it's got four little channels in it. Um, and that's where the DNA goes. So specifically, what you do if you want to sequence DNA is you chop up the DNA, you put adapters on it, and then you flow the DNA into this flow cell. And what's, what happens is the DNA sticks to the, the glass bottom of this flow cell. And through some miraculous chemistry that um, Illumina and the preceding companies that it bought up developed, um, uh, each of these single DNA molecules is turned into a cluster of many, many molecules. Um, and then you do a round of DNA synthesis where fluorescent bases are added one by one in each of these clusters. And so when you view this with a microscope, what you see is a series of dots of different colors. So in one round, you'll see like A, C, G, T. And then the next round, um, you'll see G, T, C, A, and so on. And so each one of these dots gets built into a DNA sequence about 300 base pairs long. And like I said, this machine, by viewing these flow cells, it can 
uh, reconstruct about 300 million reads in one run in this way. OK. Um, so with this newfound ability to sequence DNA, um, a wide variety of experimental methods were developed. Now, you know, the, the kind of killer application, at least initially, that everyone imagined for DNA is for healthcare. That us and each one of you will get your, uh, will get your DNA sequenced, and um, if you need to go in for medical treatments, then doctors can refer to your genome sequence, your individual personalized genome sequences, and determine what treatments um, would best suit your needs. Um, but what has happened since high-throughput sequencing came out is we realize that there's a lot more you can do with DNA sequencing than just sequencing genomes. And e so each one of these circles is a different experimental method that has been published describing a new application for high-throughput DNA sequencing. Um, this, this is time, so this says, uh, you know, when these methods were published, and this is the number of citations. So essentially a measure of how popular these different experimental methods are. Um, so clearly, uh, we don't have time to go over all of these, um, but I'm going to highlight two that's particularly relevant uh, here at Cold Spring Harbor. So in my lab, the question I'm interested in is how are genes controlled? Now, in your body, there are many, many, many different types of cells from nerve cells, muscle cells, bone cells, reproductive um, cells, blood cells, gland cells, and so on. All these cells have exactly the same DNA. They have exactly the same set of genetic instructions. Uh, the thing that makes them different is that they express different genes. And which genes get expressed in which types of cells are controlled by sequences encoded in the DNA right next to the sequences of those genes. So um, in my graduate work, um, after I was inspired to become an experimentalist, I developed a method called SortSeq um, that um, aims to provide a systematic way of determining how DNA sequences that control gene expression actually work. So say uh, you have a sequence like this, and you want to know, how does it control gene expression? Um, so the way the SortSeq assay works is you first take this sequence and you place it in front of a fluorescent protein, like the green fluorescent protein. So the green fluorescent protein, so it's, it's encoded in DNA, but then it's um, expressed as a protein that folds like this. This is a fluorescent protein from, from uh, a fluorescent jellyfish. Uh, and you shine uh, blue light on it, and it fluoresces green. It's great. Um, and this, actually, the, the use of this for biotechnology also won the Nobel Prize. Um, you then take this sequence you're interested in, and you swap it out for a very large, for, for like hundreds of thousands of different slightly mutated versions of that sequence. You then take those constructs, those mutated DNA sequences in front of the green fluorescent pro protein, and you put them into cells. So here I'm rep representing bacterial cells, E. coli cells, that I did this experiment in. And then you sort the cells according to how fluorescent they are, individually, one by one, according to how fluorescent they are. And using some miraculous technology called fluorescence-activated cell sorting that was developed actually also in the mid-1970s, uh, but unlike sequencing, hasn't really changed much since. Um, you can sort millions of cells according to their individual fluorescences um, in just an hour or so. So we have these fluorescent cells. We sort them according to how fluorescent they are into, a, uh, some, into different bins. And then within each bin, we sequence this mutated DNA sequence that we're interested in. And so the resulting data set is a long list of hundreds of thousands of mutated DNA sequences, each assigned to a different bin. And each bin, thus, this bin then serves as a measurement of how strongly genes were expressed when they, when they were put uh, um, near this control sequence. So this is me doing the experiment. Uh, I'm looking at it like that because this is 2009. And uh, high-throughput sequencing was just becoming available, um, and, but it was more expensive. So uh, we sent this little drop of water off for sequencing, and this cost $10,000. Uh, 
And this is um, basically whether my, uh, you know, PhD work was going to pan out. <laughs> <laughs> whether <laughs> that and that analyzing that one drop of water is going to work because we didn't really have money for a backup experiment if this failed, but it but it worked. Um, and so what we showed is that you could measure using information theory the importance of each position within this DNA sequence um, for expression using using that data that um, uh, we got from that drop of water. Um, and so here you see there's a lump here, a lump here, a lump here, and a lump here. Um, I mean, something important is going on here. Something important is going on here. So in fact, this tells you that some protein binds this sequence of DNA, and some protein binds this sequence of DNA. And moreover, if you analyze the data deeper, you can figure out which proteins the, the, these are and how they interact with one another inside of living cells. So uh, this uh, basic approach uh, has since been applied in many different situations. Um, my current interests um, uh, largely revolve around alternative splicing, uh, where we can do very similar experiments, uh, but, for, um, but to investigate the mechanisms of uh, human disease. So the second example I want to describe is actually not from my lab, but from Tony Zader. Um, who's a professor here at Cold Spring Harbor. And he's interested in how the brain is wired. So he's, his lab has developed a method called MapSeq that uses DNA sequencing to map connections inside the brain. So the way this works is you have a brain, and inside that brain there are lots of neurons. And the key idea is to label each neuron with a different DNA barcode. So each neuron gets assigned a DNA sequence, the DNA sequence isn't meaningful in and of itself. It's just like a barcode. The important thing is that each neuron gets a unique barcode. So the way you actually do this is you use viruses. You take some viruses, and you put these DNA barcodes into the viruses. And you can make, you can make millions of viruses containing millions of different barcodes pretty easily. Um, and then you take this, and you inject it in a mouse brain. So there. Um, doing these experiments in mice right now. And what happens is these viruses will actually trace down the long axons of neurons um, so that if you inject some virus here, um, the DNA barcode will be transferred all the way. Uh, some of it will stay in the injection site, but some of it will move to the end of the neuron. And so more specifically, what they can do is they do like hundreds of injections in a grid pattern into the mouse brain. And then they sacrifice the animal, and they dissect out little cubes of the brain using uh, laser dissection. So they call these cubelets. And then they sequence the DNA barcodes that are in each cubelet of each of these cubelets. In doing this, they're able to reconstruct many, many, many connections within a single mouse brain. Now, Tony's lab is not the first lab to try and trace connections in the brain. But usually, the way you do that is you have to inject um, fluorescent viruses into the brain of mice. And actually, there aren't that many different colors that you can resolve by fluorescence. So you have to use many, 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 many mice in order to map out connections in the brain. Here, they can map out um, hundreds or thousands of connections in the brain uh, just in a single brain, in a single mouse. And not only that, they can look to see how these connections change in different mouse models of uh, neurological disease. Um, OK, so I will leave it there and turn it over to David. Great, thanks, Justin. So, whereas um, Justin was talking about um, uh, kind of some of the fun things that you can measure um, using sequencing besides human genomes, I'm going to focus in on one particular thing um, and how um, we can use ultra high throughput sequencing um, to answer some um, very basic questions um, in evolutionary biology and, in particular, to understand um, how proteins evolve. Um, 
So the first question here is, um, what are proteins? So um, if you were in an intro uh, biology class, the, the cliche is that proteins are the workhorse of the cell. Um, uh, if you think about the organism as kind of a bag of coupled chemical reactions, proteins are um, uh, the, the, the catalysts that drive those reactions. And um, so here are some pictures of, um, of proteins that everyone should know and love. There are antibodies that um, protect you from disease, hemoglobin, which brings um, uh, 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 oxygen to your cells, um, rubisco, which is um, incredibly important in, 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 in plants and, and carbon fixation. And there are also some um, proteins that act as um, signaling molecules. For instance, um, uh, insulin um, uh, is actually a protein. Um, and although the proteins take all of these diverse shapes, um, at, uh, at the end of the day, they all actually have a, a very similar form, which is that like DNA, they're um, just a string of repeated elements. And whereas in DNA, the, um, the repeated elements are the nucleotides, A, C, G, and T, um, in proteins, the, re the repeated uh, elements are the amino acids, and there are 20 of them. So whereas a DNA sequence goes A, C, G, T, C, A, A, and so forth, Protein sequences go R, H, K, D, E, et cetera, like that. So Justin um, was talking about Fred Sanger, who won the Nobel Prize for uh, uh, inventing DNA sequencing. But actually, that was his second Nobel Prize. His first Nobel Prize um, was for inventing protein sequencing, which we've been able to do um, since the early 1950s. And actually, the, the protein that he sequenced was, was, um, was insulin. And um, kind of in the, the 10 years that followed, um, people actually started to f um, catalog a large number of um, protein sequences. So for instance, um, this is um, Margaret Dayhoff, who kind of um, uh, invented uh, the field of bioinformatics and the idea of assembling large databases of, of sequences and analyzing them with computers. And um, so this was the 1960s, and so when they wanted to uh, 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 disseminate this, uh, this, this database. They actually did it um, in book form, and every year they would come out with a book with all of the new um, uh, protein um, uh, sequences. Um, and so this, this new kind of data um, led to my favorite kind of science, um, uh, uh, which, is, which is rampant speculation. Um, and and the, the reason is, is, is that there was, there was kind of a mystery there was a mystery to be found, which is that you know, they started to have the same protein. So this is the protein sequence of cytochrome C, um, which is it, it involved in respiration. And they, they had the copy in human, monkey, uh, you know, in fish and fungi, all the way to bacterium. And, and they started to see these, um, these um, uh, that the sequences were in some ways quite similar. Um, that, like there were some positions in the sequence where the same amino acid has been there seemingly the whole history of life, but then there are other positions where there are, are where you can observe um, changes in the sequence, and so people started coming up with all of these creative ideas um, to to ask the question of, of how can we, we can understand the evolution of these protein sequences, and so um, there were ideas like the. The, um, the molecular clock, for instance, and, and my favorite idea, which is the idea of protein sequence space. So let, let me just read this idea. This is from um, uh, John Maynard Smith, who is, I guess, um, most famous for his contributions to game theory. But, um, uh, but he gave this um, kind of uh, metaphor of what, um, of what protein evolution is like. So let me just read out what he says. He says, the model of protein evolution I want to discuss is best understood by analogy with a popular word game. The object of the game is to pass from one word to another of the same length by changing one letter at a time with the requirement that all the intermediate words are meaningful in the same language. Thus, the string W-O-R-D, word, can be converted into the string G-E-N-E, -E, gene, in the minimum number of step steps as follows. So, so the idea is we're going to change word into gene, and we're going to change one letter at a time, and all of the intermediates have to be valid words. So he says, OK, first change the D to an E, and then the W to a G, and then you can change the R to the N, 
And then you can change this O to an E and get gene. Word war gorgon gene. Um, and um, so th this has been actually a really influential way of thinking about protein evolution um, because there are all sorts of ways that you can kind of turn this idea around um, that kind of uh, uh, get at core concepts. Um, uh, and so evolutionary biologists have talked this to the, about this a lot, but what very few of them know is that actually this, this word game was invented um, by Lewis Carroll um, in, uh, in 1879. Um, and in fact, um, uh, he himself was um, an aficionado of evolution. And one of, uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the puzzles that he posed was how to evolve man from ape. Um, and um, here's his, his solution, you take ape you change uh, the P to an R to get R, then the A to an E to get air, uh, this E to an R to get er, then the R to an A to get ear, uh, the E to an M to get mar, and finally the R to the N to get man. Um, so this is, uh, this, is, this is Lewis Carroll's version of, um, of, of, of evolution. But you can also think about this um, uh, in, a more, in a more serious or systematic way. Um, so one of the things that you can think about in this model is that, okay, each word is of length four, and at each position in the word, you can have any of the 26 letters. And so you can ask the question, okay, well, which of these, which of the changes are allowed? So this is a chart showing for um, Maynard Smith's progression, which changes are allowed. So for instance, uh, so, so th th this chart has, has different letters, A for allowed, B for blocked, and C for current. So for instance, in word, you can't change the W to an A, because that would be aord, which is not a word. But you can change the O to an A, which is uh, wor ward in the sense of like, say, a voting district, right? Um, and then here's the C here, showing that the, the last letter is currently D. Um, so th the interesting thing is that as you change, as you make substitutions, as you change one letter to another, like word to war, you change which other um, mutations are allowable. So those are the ones highlighted um, in orange. So you can see every time you make a substitution, you change which other mutations you can make, which other, which other um, letters you can swap in at each position. And so you can think about as evolution is happening, that at the same time, the paths that are allowable are changing underneath. And so people have tried to model this kind of, um, uh, of, of process. Um, then there are other ways of thinking about um, this system. So we can think about the space of all possible uh, uh, strings of characters of a certain length. So if we only had uh, 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 two possibilities. This is a very old picture from this fellow Sewell Wright, who is one of the founders of uh, modern evolutionary biology, um, who was thinking about this. So he says, you know, um, if we if if we if we have two possible letters, then what you get is things which look like if you have strings of length two, you have it's like a square. Then if it's length three, you get a cube. Then with longer sequences, you get these. Um, uh, these hypercubes, and you could extend this to having 26 letters instead of two, and that's kind of what you get in proteins um, or in these word sequences. And so then you can start to think about the set of allowable words as being um, a subgraph of this big high dimensional graph. So you can think about the structure of the network of all allowable words where you connect two words if you can change one to the other by only. Um, uh, uh, changing one letter. And so um, in, uh, in English, um, this is what that, the structure of that network turns out to look like. Um, so, um, uh, so this is, uh, a, there are about 4,000 four-letter words in English. Um, this is the, um, the uh, there's about 3,900 of them shown here which form this connected network. I figured this was likely to be an adult audience, so there are also some rude, um, Words which I have not removed here. Um, you know, as scientists, we need to be hard-nosed and let the, the data lie where it may, so they're in there too. Um, and the interesting thing about this is you can see that the network, it, it, it seems to have some structure to it. 
Um, and if you look and you see what the structure is, um, it turns out that the, the main determinant of these clusters is which letter is a vowel. So like this cluster over here is all the sequences where the first letter is a vowel. And this cluster over here is all the sequences where the second. And these are the sequences where the third letter is a vowel. And these are the sequences where the, the fourth letter is a vowel. And the, the reason why you see this kind of structure is because in English, right, every, every word has to have a vowel some, someplace, except for like sh and pst, if you count those. I don't think those count if you're playing Scrabble or something, right? But, but most words have at least one vowel. And so if you want to evolve from, one, from having a vowel in, say, the second position to having a vowel in the third position, you have to go through, say, this cluster of sequences here, which have both their second letter at a vowel as a vowel and, and the third level letter. So you have to gain a vowel and then lose it. And so that, that basic fact about English highly structures what this kind of fanciful evolutionary process of words, of, of word evolution is like. So anyhow, so you know, people have been thinking about this and talking about this um, since the 1960s and 70s. Um, and um, now, um, these, these ultra-high throughput sequencing technologies are allowing us to actually um, make these networks and look at their structure for real proteins, right? So it's not just a kind of metaphor anymore. Now we can really um, look at what the, the network of functional sequences looks like. And so I'll tell you how that's done. So it's done by, by a, a type of, of experiment that goes, that goes something like this. You, you have some library of protein sequence variants. So you have, say, the, the, the sequence that you find in nature, and then you make mutations in that sequence. You swap in an amino acid or two different amino acids in particular positions, and you make this library of sequences. And then you put one such sequence into, um, into each cell. And what happens is that some of the cells get a, a good sequence, and they're happy, and they divide and divide. And some cells get an eh, OK sequence, and they maybe divide a little bit. And some of them get one that just doesn't work at all, and then they're very sick or the cell dies. right? And so then once you let the cells grow up for a while, um, then you get mostly the functional sequences back. And in fact, by, if, by using ultra-high throughput sequencing, to measure the frequency of variants in the initial library and comparing that to the frequency of those same variants in the final library, um, you can calculate how well each of these protein sequences works. Um, so let me show you an example of, a, of an experiment with, um, uh, uh, with this kind of um, design. It was done on this, um, on this uh, uh, protein found in um, streptococcal bacteria called um, protein G. Um, and the way that this uh, protein works is that it actually binds human antibodies. And what happens is that your antibodies bind to the streptococcal bacteria, and then they get bound by this protein, and so then your body has a hard time recognizing them, and so then the, um, the bacterium doesn't get eaten by macrophages, and it's happy. And so this is part of how this bacterium fools your immune system. And um, there was an experiment done um, to look at what happens when you put any word of length four, four amino acids at these four, sequence, uh, these four positions in the protein, which had previously been shown to interact in very odd ways, in the sense that if you change the amino acid at this position and then change it at this other position, when you combine those two mutations, it was very hard to predict what was going to happen. Um, and so there was an experiment done to, to measure um, the binding of this protein um, uh, to antibodies um, that measured all um, 20 to the 4, which is 160,000 protein variants. Um, and so I'll show you um, a picture of what the data looked like. So this is an actual network um, derived from this uh, high throughput data. And um, so each, of the, each little dot here is a, is a separate sequence. And they're colored by how well they bind. So these like, really bright wet red ones are ones that bind even better than the sequence that you see in nature, which is plotted right here. And then most of them don't bind very well at all. Um, uh, and then um, these sequences are plotted such a way, in such a way that um, the distances between them um, 
uh, best approximate the time that it would take um, to evolve from one sequence to another um, under evolution to have high levels of binding. Um, and so um, what you can see is that there are kind of these three um, different clouds of high binding sequences, um, which are in these boxes, regions one, two, and three. So region one is where the, the natural sequence um, is found. And all of these, uh, these, these high binding sequences in region one have the, the G as the third letter in their, in their, in their four letter word. And if you go over here and you look at these sequences, most of them that bind well um, will end in uh, LG or FG. And then down here, um, these sequences tend to end uh, in AA or CA. So there are th these three separate groups of high binding sequences where it's hard to bind to one, to, to evolve from one to another. And in fact, we can um, write down a simple model within each of these regions um, that does a pretty good job of um, predicting the binding, but we need to have a separate simple model for each of these three regions. Um, and so essentially what we get, um, it, what we see is that the space of possible sequences looks like most sequences are here in the middle and it's flat. And then there are these three different separate solutions, which are like peaks of high binding, which are kind of broadly separated from each other. Um, and so now that we have a picture like this, we can start to ask questions about evolution. Um, so, um, um, uh, so here's the streptococcal sequence we were looking at. It turns out that, um, uh, that um, there's uh, uh, another human commensal, um, lactobacillus inners, um, which has a, a, a homologous protein, which has a sequence over here. Um, in this region, and so we can do things like we can plot all of the minimal possible paths to evolve from one of these sequences to another, and then we can ask, well, what's the probability of evolving via any of these paths? And we can see that they come in these two, two different ways of going. One of them is via this intermediate that ends in GG, um, and the other one is via an intermediate that ends in LV. And by um, calculating the probabilities of each of these paths, we can calculate that about 80% of the time you would evolve this way um, rather than this way. Um, so this is just for one protein, um, but actually um, a number of proteins have been um, assayed in this way now. So for instance, this is a network showing only um, the most functional sequences uh, for this E. coli protein, FOQ, um, which is involved in magnesium. Um, uh, sensing, and um, here's a, a, a similar network um, for um, uh, the, um, the steroid receptor protein in mammals. Um, and so I think it's a really exciting time um, to be involved in this area, um, sort of like being in the 1960s and seeing these, these protein sequences, ju you know, just, just 20 different protein sequences. Um, and, and starting to be able to, um, to, to, to think deep thoughts about them. It's just that instead of having 20 different protein sequences, instead we have 100,000 different measurements of how well proteins do for 20 different proteins. Um, and we can start to ask, um, what are the major features of, 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 these, um, of these protein sequence spaces? We saw that for um, words, it's the position of the vowels. What's the analogous fact for proteins. So that's the kind of question that I think that we'll be able to answer in the next um, few years. Um, I want to also end on a kind of uh, a more humanistic note. Um, you know, um, the, the, the proteins that we see in nature, are, they're related to each other by evolutionary history. And actually, one of the, the contributions of Margaret Dayhoff, who I showed earlier, was on making some of the first programs to infer what these ancestral sequences will be. Um, and so th th there are projects underway to really construct the whole, this, the evolutionary history of individual proteins over the whole um, tree of life. Um, and then um, to also um, ask at each intermediate sequence to, to look at all of the possible mutations to the sequence. And, and this is a, a really beautiful way to look at history because we can look at the paths not taken. If you think about, say, human history, um, uh, you, can, you can think what would happen if Booth hadn't shot Lincoln or something like that. That question seems vague and unscientific. 
But because of the structure of protein sequence space, we can say, no, at any one time, there was one particular protein sequence, and we can actually, and there are only so many options for which ways evolution can go. There are only so many positions, and at each position, there are only 19 possible mutations. And because we can now measure millions and millions of mutations, we can now, in a very scientific way, um, understand the paths that were taken and the paths that weren't. Um, so with that, I just want to thank my lab, um, and in particular, my um, postdoc, Juanan Zhou, who uh, um, did um, all of the work on um, the protein G story. So thank you. <laughs> Ty, so um, thank, I'm going to have to carry this. All right, thank you guys for staying so long um, for the last of these talks. I'll be the last one. So I'm Molly Gale Hamill. I started out in physics like Justin did. I was actually working on how dark matter and dark energy contribute to how our universe develops, right? So we know that it influences the distribution of all the beautiful galaxies and stars that we see in the sky. And this was, again, early 2000s. And at the same time that all of these amazing questions were going on in astronomy and astrophysics, there were even more amazing questions going on in biology because there really was a revolution going on. And one of the biggest revolutions was the sequencing of the human genome and understanding what actually was in our own genomes. And all of these papers started coming out talking about the dark matter in our genomes, the parts of it that we didn't understand, right? And I heard those words, I heard that stuff about dark matter in our genomes, and this caught my attention, this got me paying attention to what was going on. Um, and even though it's very different than what we were talking about in astrophysics, it was so cool. And so I'm going to tell you about all of the parts of this that I find super cool and how we use this in my research. Right? So, okay, so like Justin told you about, the first human genome that was released in sort of a draft version in about 2001, it cost hundreds of millions of dollars. There were thousands of scientists across the world working to get this one copy of what an average human genome looked like to put together. This was 20 institutions, including here at Cold Spring Harbor, and it took them 15 years. It took them 15 years to put it together in the way that Justin was telling you about. Right? Um, we now do this routinely for, uh, we can sequence a genome, your genome, my genome, um, for about $2,000, we can do it about a day or two, right? Because now we know what the average answer looks like and we can just look and compare how each new one looks compared to that one, right? So it's now very easy and very cheap for us to do this very, very quickly. But getting that first one assembled was massive, right? And now the question is, how do our genomes differ from each other, right? So, okay. so. Here we go. Um, so our genomes contain our genes, right? Your genes are encoded in the DNA that Justin was telling you about. Um, and you can think of the DNA as that information storage. It contains all of the instructions for making you, but your cells still have to decide when to make each piece, right? It wants to make sure that it doesn't start making a toenail in the middle of your eye for example, right? And so when it decides that it's going to take one of those genes and do something with it, it goes and it makes an RNA copy, and that RNA gets then turned into a protein. So proteins, like they said, are the workhorses. They do everything in your body. So the pigment that gives your hair and your skin color, that's a protein. The enzymes that break down food, that's a protein, right? So when your body wants to do something, it goes back to that DNA, makes a copy to get a recipe, and then makes the protein. And so this is very similar to when I get home and my kids say, I really want brownies, right? So I get out my cookbook, I make one, a copy of one printed recipe so that I can make that particular thing, and then I make what they ask me to make, which for my kids, it's brownies. Okay, so I think when people now think about what our genome is, right, if you have an idea of what you think your genome looks like inside the cell, you probably think that there's a lot, that there's genes, that it's basically long strings and there's little genes and each one of those genes codes for a trait that we have. Maybe somebody has red hair and they have the gene that gives them red hair, the particular gene variant that gives them red hair, or the gene that gives them blue eyes or makes them taller than average. None of these describe me, for example, but somebody might have these particular genes. Um, and believe it or not, this is a necklace you can buy on Etsy, right, um, that contains this. And I think this is probably the idea, the kind of cartoon idea most people have of what a genome looks like. Um, so we sequenced that first human genome 20 years ago now, and the first biggest surprise that we got out of that is it doesn't look like that at all. In fact, 98% of your genome is not genes. It's not the part that codes for proteins and that gives you each of these different traits. This is what we're calling the dark matter, and this is what they were referring to when they started talking about the dark matter 
in their genomes. And what they meant by that is this is the, p the part of our genomes where we have no idea what it does, but we know that it's not coding for genes. And this was the big mystery about 20 years ago now. So since that time, we've been able to figure out what a lot of these different parts of our genome are, genomes are. So for example, we know that um, some, about 30% of it is, are these regulatory sequences that turn our genes on and off. So Justin and David were telling you a little bit about this. We need to turn the right gene on in the right place, and then we need to turn it back off again when we're done, right? And so about 30% of our genome encodes sequences that do that. Um, another bit is intron spacers to break up the genes. Um, and then about half of the genome um, turns out to be uh, parasitic sequences, things that are essentially not you. And this is what I work on, right? Um, these are called jumping genes, and I'm going to tell you why in just a second. But what I need you to understand from the biggest takeaway from this is that half of your genome is not you, essentially. Half of your genome is, is from these ancient parasites that we're still carrying around with us. Um, go forward, go forward. Okay, so I, I'm going to, warning, a little bit of warning. I love New Yorker cartoons. Um, this is where things get a little bit weird when I'm going to try and explain to you how these things got into our genome and what they do. Um, and so for those in the back who can't read this, it says, my desire to be well informed is currently at odds with my desire to stay sane, right? Clearly they were talking about transposons, of course, uh, and I'll tell you why. Okay, so the idea is that a transposon can transfer its position in your genome from one place to another. These are jumping genes that can go from one spot in your genome and move to another spot. And so I think the best way to understand this is if, for example, you have an active transposon sequence over here in your genome, and somewhere else you have a really important gene, maybe the one that gives you the pigment that gives you red hair, for example, um, an active transposon will jump out of its spot and into that particular gene, and it generally when a transposon break, uh, jumps into another gene, it'll break it so that that gene is non-functional anymore. And so you can imagine this as being going from someone who's making red pigment to no longer having the gene encodes for that red pigment anymore, no red hair. Um, now again, fair warning, this is actually a made up example. This is not why some people have red hair and some people do not have red hair, um, but there are examples like this that are real. Right? Um, so an example um, for the very first human disease that was ever associated with transposon sequences was about 30 years ago when they figured out that hemophilia was caused by one of these active transposons jumping into the factor VIII gene, which helps in blood clotting. And in that particular example, that's exactly what happened. The transposon hopped in, it broke that gene, and it, was, and it caused hemophilia in that particular patient. Okay. Uh, Go forward, there we go. So what are these transposons? So transposable elements, transposons, these parasites in our genome, they're not just in ours, they're actually in every plant and animal genome there is. And so the first place where these were actually discovered was by Barbara McClintock. She was right, working right here at Cold Spring Harbor. Um, and she was able to figure out in the 1940s, long before we knew what genomes looked like, that there were things moving around in our genome. And that when they were moving around in our genome, they were breaking these pigment genes that were making the corn kernels purple here. And she was able to figure out from the amazing patterns in the maize kernels, from cornfields going right over here by the harbor, that there was something moving around in our genome and that when it was moving around, it was breaking the genes that it was adjacent to. So she's amazing. We should always do, give a little bit of honor to Barbara, uh, right? Um, so, there's lots of different types of transposons. Probably the easiest kind to explain to you um, are what are called viral sto stowaways, right? So these are actually um, uh, viruses that decided to insert themselves into our genomes, and that is a thing that can happen, but I'll tell you more about that in a second. So first, let's just talk about how viruses work, right? So a virus particle um, carries around its genes with it, but it doesn't have all of the machinery of a cell. It can't make its own proteins, so it can't do anything with its genes until it infects your cells, right? So they need to hijack your machinery in order to take their viral genes and make RNA copies and make proteins out of those, right? Um, there's a certain class of viruses called retroviruses. They actually hack the whole system by inserting themselves directly into your genome. Right? And you're now carrying that around with you, and that vi those viral genes in your genome now make viral RNA and viral proteins for each of those cells that's infected. Right? Okay, 
and so the biggest question that I always get when I, when I say this is, is, is somebody says, so wait, every time I get a cold, does that mean that I get virus DNA in my genome? And every time I get another cold, my genome is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger? And no, it's not that bad, <laughs> right? So uh, it's actually kind of rare um, for this to persist, right? So let's talk about why. So first of all, not every virus can do this. Not every virus can actually insert its genes into your genome. There's only a certain uh, subset that can. It's a certain subset of retroviruses. And for the ones that can, most of them will infect a few different kinds of cells. Maybe you'll get a rhinovirus in your nose. Maybe you'll get a viral infection somewhere else, right? And those cells will get cleared by your immune system, right? They'll get killed and they'll get those, they're not going to stick, stick around, right? Um, but there is a subset that can insert its viral genome into your genome and stick around. Um, and because that's true, um, there are some viral infections that are particularly hard to cure because they are now essentially a part of you, right? Okay, so when this does happen, so when this does happen, once the virus inserts its genome into yours, it becomes an endogenous retrovirus. So endogenous just means it's in you now, right? So this is how that works. This starts out as a normal virus infection, right? Some, somebody in the population gets infected with this virus. Um, some of these viruses can infect not just, for example, your nose, but they can actually infect the germline cells, the sperm and eggs that will get, where the genomes there will get passed on to the next generation, right? This is how this becomes part of the human genome, right? Is when it infects the cells that get passed on to the children, right? Okay, so it inserts its viral DNA into your genome. For some reason, it doesn't get cleared um, and, it, and it's able to lay dormant in there inside those germ cells and get passed on, right? Um, so the last time we know that this happened and that this happened and persisted for everyone was about two million years ago. And that's what I mean by this is kind of rare for this to get passed on um, to children for in infecting germ cells. So all, every single human being has about 100 different copies of the human endogenous retrovirus HERV-K. And this is the last one where we know it infected our ancestors, it got passed on to everybody, and we all have it. Most of the cop copies we have are broken so that it doesn't act like a virus anymore in the sense that it's not infectious. It can't make viral particles that you then infect somebody else with, right? So it's got that piece of it broken. Um, so that's why we call it a viral stowaway, meaning it's there in our genomes and it can still do a little bit of damage. It can still cause trouble if it starts to limp along and pretend it's a virus again. But for better or worse, it's stuck in your genome and it's not going to get passed, uh, caught by anybody else. It's not infectious anymore. Okay. So then I've told you half our genome is transposons. When they're activated, they can break adjacent genes. I've told you some of these act like retroviruses. And so a fair question would be, how come we're most, mostly OK? Why isn't every cell a wild west of these transposons hopping around and breaking everything everywhere they go, right? Which is a fair question. And uh, the biggest reason um, is that most of these are essentially fossilized remains. These are scars left over from ancient battles that were fought with these retroviruses or these transposons um, over evolutionary time, and we're just keeping remnants of them. We're keeping fossilized pieces of these long past infections, right? Um, so even 99.9% .9 of them, of the, of the transposon sequences that are in our genomes are no longer able to, to hop around and move anymore. They can't break genes and activate themselves. But remember, I told you that these are half your genome, and Justin told you that your genome is three billion base pairs big, right? So even if 0.1% of these are still active, that's thousands, right? Okay, so your cells spend a lot of time trying to keep these off uh, for, those, for those remaining few thousand or so that are still active. And what do I mean by mostly okay? Um, well, I did tell you about that one mutation we found um, where a uh, hemophilia was caused by one of these transposons jumping into the blood clotting gene factor eight, right? Um, but what I didn't tell you um, is that they found this because they knew where to look. They knew the patient had hemophilia. They were looking for mutations in genes that were associated with that. They didn't have to sequence the whole genome. They could just look at a handful of genes that they knew were likely culprits to be involved. Right? But what if that wasn't the right place to look? Right? So again, this is one of my favorite cartoons. This is, this is a policeman for the people in the back saying, is this where you lost your wallet? And the man on his hands and knees says, oh, no, no, I lost it in the park, but this is where the street lamp is. 
right? And this is this idea that you can only look at things that you actually have the tools to look for. You can only look where there's light for you to see, right? So if, the, if you know which gene to look for, maybe you'll get lucky and you'll find one of these transposons that was actually causing the disease, but what if that's not the right place to look? And that's where sequencing whole genomes becomes really important, right? So that you can actually just look anywhere that these things could be. Right? So once we did get the ability to sequence a whole genome, um, we started noticing that these transposon-induced mutations were everywhere. That, for example, in cancer patients, there's between 10 and 100 different mutations in every cancer tumor. Um, and for some reason that I don't fully understand, uh, the neurons in the brain, the very long-lived cells that you think you would want to protect because we really need those things, um, there's maybe one or 20 different transposon insertions per neuron in the brain now that we've been able to look with these things with whole genome sequencing, right? Um, and we're still trying to figure out what that means um, in terms of what those could be causing. And in particular, my lab works on this, on making the tools for looking at these things better so that we can understand whether or not there's a relationship between transposon activity for example, and neurodegenerative disease. So I work on the neurodegenerative disease, ALS, and whether these things might be related. Okay, but I told you, oh yeah, sure, now we can sequence a whole genome, it's super easy, it's a couple thousand dollars, and maybe one of the people who actually does the experiments in my lab, this is part of my lab here, might say, yeah, sure, sequence the whole genome, Molly says. Um, but let me just back up and tell you a little bit about why that's still hard, right? So I'm gonna tell you how genome sequencing works, and then, and then I'll end. Right, so um, we have a three billion base pair genome, right? And the way that we sequence it is we can sequence little pieces at a time. We can sequence maybe 500 or 1,000 base pairs, chunks at a time of this three billion base pair long sequence. And so what we do is we chop it up into all these little bits, and then we sequence a little bit from each end, and then we try to map the ends together, right? And that's something similar to this idea that you have a puzzle to put together. You don't know what the final thing looks like. There's just one color and some of the pieces are a little bit strange and you think, okay, well, this is a hard problem but get enough computers and this is doable, right? And for the most part, that's generally true. Um, one of the biggest problems is that um, some, of your piece, some of the pieces of your genome actually look almost exactly the same as other pieces of the genome and that's actually the transposon sequences. And the reason is they can make copies of themselves. So one that sits over here can, make a can jump into a new spot and then make a copy of itself and jump somewhere else, and there's a whole bunch of different versions of these that almost look exactly identical. And that's when the problem gets really hard. And that's why part of my lab really works on making the algorithms better um, so that we can actually put these things together even when it's the really hard case where they look almost exactly the same as each other. Right? And we're at the point where this is basically 99% doable, too. So if you think of chopping your genome into little, little bits and then trying to put it back into the picture of what your genome actually looks like, we can mostly do this now, right? There are some, still some parts that are really hard, and my lab works on that. But I think one um, idea that I just wanted to end with is that we think about sequencing our genome and we think of that as being the answer, that we, we sequence our genome and we know what all of our genes look like, but I also just told you that there are these mutational processes that cause changes. And in fact, those changes can happen in your body over time. So whereas you might have started with one pristine genome that's the same in every cell, maybe the one that your parents gave you, you can think that over time through different mutational processes, including ones induced by transposons, but lots of other things too, you might get a version of your genome that looks a little bit more like Barbara's corn from all of the different things that, you've, that have accumulated, right? Okay, so just to recap, your genome is full of ancient parasites called transposons. These are part of what makes up the dark matter of your genome where we really don't fully understand what it does yet. Um, we're just getting the tools to look at these properly. It's really been about five or 10 years where the sequencing has been good enough for us to really look at these. Um, and I'm also telling you that now that we have these tools, we can start understanding which human diseases might be related to aberrant activity of transposons and other mutational processes in our genome. Um, and once again, this is my full lab. These are all of the people who actually do the work that I was telling you about today. And, and thank you for staying to the end of this session today. And please join us out in the lobby. There's coffee reception out in the lobby for everybody.